Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, this is Monday, April 13th, and this is Intro to Philosophy, uh, Cal State Fullerton. This is our 230 to 345 uh, section. Great to see you guys and hope you're all doing really well. Um, we're just moving ahead in our lecture series, just continuing in the same order that we see written in the syllabus. And uh, today our goal is to advance a little further <clears throat> through these notes on the subject of time. So we're going to try and wrap up the writing of Albert Einstein. And then um, if I can, I'll try to go over the a topic of Ted Sider's paper too. And then that'll take us ahead in the class. Um, we have yet to assign a second paper, but I wanted to give you guys two weeks to work on it. So my plan uh, was, first of all, due to the fact of the postponement of uh, the schedule with one class session that had to be moved because of the whole COVID, um, I'm going to uh, modify the due date just slightly. So it's originally listed as Wednesday the 29th, and I just want to replace that with uh, Monday the 4th of May. So given the fact that it's due Monday of week 15, and this is Monday of week 12, I'm thinking I'll, dis I'll distribute the uh, essay prompts over this coming weekend. Therefore, you'll have at least two weeks uh, to, to work on the last paper. Um, and we are going to try to catch up a little bit. I'm going to probably take out uh, one paper on the subject of philosophy of mind and take out one paper on the topic of time. But we're definitely going to continue with Einstein and Ted Sider for today and then notifications to follow about maybe a deleted article or two um, in between now and Wednesday. So you could just follow your titanium notifications for that. Um, but at any rate, we're covering Einstein today slash Ted Sider. And then distribution of essay prompts will follow this upcoming weekend. You'll have two weeks to work on it, and there will be a few optional topics there. So just a couple of pointers, um, but we still have time before class starts. So I'm just kind of uh, getting it going a little early for the convenience of all you guys that are ready to start early and get prepared for the 2.30 meeting. <clears throat> Hope you guys are all doing good and staying healthy and safe with the quarantine situation. Uh, let's see. We've reached the stage of the whole uh, quarantine, I guess, where I'm going into the video game collection and trying to pass a little bit of free time with that. So anybody who has suggestions of anything across any of those consoles, I'd love to hear your suggestions. I just finally bought the uh, Breath of the Wild Zelda game for the Switch. Um, I've been holding out on it because I was working on some other games, but now I just figure why not. So I'm playing that one a little bit. Um, there's this Untitled Goose game. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but I also got that one for the Switch. So that's kind of a silly game, not too difficult, but definitely fun in the design of it. It won some awards for its gameplay design and stuff. So fun, different game. You're like basically this goose who's like harassing and has some people in this little British village or whatever. Um, yeah, so once the lecture's over, I might get back into that. Uh, yeah, just viewing a lot of stuff on streaming services, playing some games, grading, reading, you know, watching the news. Same as a lot of you guys, I'm sure. But I hope whatever circumstances you're in right now, you're doing well. Things are going decently uh, for you at this time in the semester. I'm trying to just keep things consistent for you guys and, um, you know, make sure that you had an uninterrupted, you know, semester uh, where we're all kind of doing our responsible duties and, maintaining, you know, consistency despite these disruptions. <clears throat> but welcome one and all. Anybody at any time, feel free to just tap in and comment and say hi. Uh, it's always nice to see who's in attendance and who's doing the live stream on any given day. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's just a few minutes or so until the official class time. So just kind of... Uh, little downtime. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Hey, Abraham, Brisa, all of you guys, Isabel. <clears throat> Great to see you guys.
And as usual, um, just want to always remind you, you can feel free at any point to uh, question, comment uh, of anything. Abraham, maybe just showing up, I was saying a moment ago that yes, I will be distributing the prompt for SA2 this weekend, and I'm going to modify the due date just by one class meeting. So instead of it being due on Wednesday, the 29th uh, of April, I'm going to modify it to the following Monday, Monday, the 4th of May. And I like to have there be a two week window for you to complete the paper. So uh, by distributing it over the weekend, you'll have more than two weeks in advance of the May 4th due date. So you will be getting that prompt over the weekend and we'll talk about it on Monday meeting a week from today. And then it will be due uh, Monday, the 4th of May, Monday of the 15th week. So that's the plan. Uh, good question. And thank you for that. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? You guys playing or watching anything? I only got a couple minutes of downtime to ask kind of silly questions like that, but if you did, I'd be happy to hear it. Otherwise, no worries. <clears throat> I guess I'm kind of like growing my hair out too now. I mean, there's no barber or whatever. I would have probably already gone back out of fade by now, but it's just going to come in at least for a few months or whatever. I don't want to endanger nobody's life over in the barber shop. So. <clears throat> Just another minute, almost ready to go. Welcome to all you guys showing up. <clears throat> you know, and try your best to um, maintain your own good habits and consistency when it comes to attendance. Um, I know right now people are thinking, you know, I just want to survive or whatever. Uh, but you still got to try and maintain a little bit of your focus and so on on these classes. I know you will, but uh, just reminding you to do that because it's it's just going to be to anybody's disadvantage if they're thinking, let me just phone in these last few weeks and just kind of, you know, do like a half job of, of watching the lectures and reading the notes and reading the, the uh, essays because, you know, you don't want to um, undermine your progress this late in the game. So, Roosh, your question, when will we be able to see our overall grade for the semester at any time? I mean, uh, you know your first two grades. I could calculate your score based on that. Um, so just send, send me an email. I'll tell you. If you don't know your grades for the assignments, number one and two, then um, then you maybe didn't collect the first one or didn't check on your grade for the midterm, but they're both scored. Everyone's grades are done for the first two assignments. So if there's any uh, confusion at all, let me know, and I'll tell you by email what your grade is. The first essay was worth 15% and the midterm was worth 30% of your grade overall. But if you want a little more detail, I'll definitely give it to you, so not to worry. Okay, everyone, thanks so much. So it's 2.30 and uh, here we are together. Welcome back, all you guys. This is uh, Intro to Philosophy, Monday, April 13th, and uh, Cal State Fullerton. Welcome to everybody in our 2.30 to 3.45 class. Miss you guys. Well, um, I don't know if we could say it's missing or not, but good to see you at any rate. Hey, Sean, Sarush, Abraham, everybody else that's watching this lecture. Um, okay, so, and just a few points that I've mentioned just a while ago before official class time. Um, I will distribute essay prompts for the upcoming essay over the weekend, and I'm going to make a slight alteration to the listed due date because we had one class uh, period that had to be um, suspended because of COVID transition to online. Therefore, I want to move the due date of SA2 just slightly by one meeting. So it's going to be moved to Monday, May 4th, instead of Wednesday, April 29th. And um, I'll give you guys the prompts over the weekend so you'll have over two weeks to work on them. And then we'll speak about them here in our live stream on Monday next week. 
so that we're all totally clear on the uh, guidelines for a successful second essay. There will be a couple of optional prompts that will deal with the different topics that we're studying. Uh, so anyways, you'll be invited to look at it and get started with your work after I distribute it over the weekend. But before that, we're just continuing through the lectures this week. We're going to try to get done with the topic of time and then make a transition into the next subject, which is the philosophy of mind. Okay. Um, so if there's ever any questions about that or anything else, do let me know. But uh, hopefully we're all on the same page. First two assignments are done and graded. We're looking forward to essay two. The prompts are coming over the weekend. You have two weeks to work on it. And of course, the final exam is the last thing of all. And I'll distribute the study guide for that about uh, 10 days or so before the final. And we'll have two review sessions where we're going to go over all those questions in good detail. So we have uh, everything set out. OK, so let's go back to the lecture. And the main topic this week, well, branching into this week from last week is time. So time is our subject matter. And we began looking at the writing of Albert Einstein on that topic. So we just got started with Einstein, and we didn't finish. So I'm going to continue on his uh, material. So yet again, this is Albert Einstein, well-known, world-famous physicist and philosopher. Um, this is from his 1916 book titled in our textbook, Time and the Relativity of Simultaneity. Albert Einstein, Time and the Relativity of Simultaneity. This is our second look at this. We just got started towards the end of last meeting. So Einstein's famous for revolutionizing our understanding of time and space. Um, he took us away from the older Newtonian conception of space and time, which said that the two things were independent from each other and had no effect on one another. So in Newton's view, no matter how fast or how slow objects move through space, that could have no effect at all on the rate of time's passage. But Einstein showed that that's not quite correct. The time and space are not separate from each other, but that they're integrated into a common structure such that when objects move through space, it does in fact affect the rate of time's passage relative to other observers moving at a different speed or standing at rest. So the question that is asked at the beginning of his paper here has to do with two lightning strikes occurring along a railway embankment. So let this be the railway track. And suppose that at these two points, A and B, lightning strikes occur. OK, next thing he says is, I want you to assume these are simultaneous lightning strikes. Then he asks what appears at first to be a straightforward question. What does it mean that they are simultaneous? What's the explanation of the concept of simultaneity? He says it's not so easy to define the concept as it may seem at first, because any initial attempt to explain what simultaneous means will probably just amount to you repeating the concept simultaneous by saying something that is equivalent to same time as. But we are interested in the deeper question, what does it mean for two events to occur at the same time? And he says, if we cannot provide an answer to this question, which is so precise that we could establish an experiment to determine whether the two events were simultaneous or not, if we don't have the means by which to create a test for simultaneity, then we may be using the word with no meaning or with an undefined meaning. So he says, let us try our best then to design an experiment which could be used to answer this question, are the two events simultaneous or not? So next here is his test proposed by Einstein in order to test whether these two things are simultaneous. He says, okay, consider the distance between A and B and think of that as like a line segment, the line segment AB. Now, if you remember from your studies earlier in life maybe, or currently, I don't know, in geometry, um, there is a midpoint that lies in between the line segment AB. Isn't that correct? I mean, any interval of distance by definition has a midpoint. It's the point which exactly divides the length. So let's say here is the midpoint and label it M. 
This is the point which is equidistant from A and from B. So the length from A to M is the same as the length from B to M. Okay, let us place an observer standing here at that midpoint. There's the observer. This observer is standing still. They're not in motion. They're at rest. So they're just standing still right here at the midpoint M. Okay? Now, <clears throat> a couple of more points. This person who stands at M, in order for them to evaluate whether the two lightning strikes are simultaneous or not, they have to be positioned far back enough from A and B that they can see those two points in one field of vision. Does that make sense to you guys? Why is it important that the person not have to, let's say, change their angle of viewing to see A and B? Like, why is it important that they can just see both in one common field of vision instead of being so close to like A that when they look at A, they have to quickly turn their head to see B? Why is it important that they have the ability to see both? Because if they couldn't see both at once, then could they even determine whether they were simultaneous? Of course not. Because if they were not able to see both in one field of vision, then even if they saw A lightning strike, and then they quickly averted their gaze to the direction of B and saw B as a lightning strike, there's a time delay in between the amount of time that it spent to turn their head from A to B. So unless you could just see both in one common field of vision, there'd be no way for this observer to answer the question, were they simultaneous or not? Does this make sense? Like he has to basically be able to see them both at once. So either he's gotta be far back enough to see them both at once, or he would have to have some type of mirrored system where like a 90 degree mirror refracts the light from one towards where he's viewing so he could see them both in one field of vision that way. Okay, so large point made small. He just has to be able to see both of those things from his position at M. Okay, so we make sure he can. Now, if this individual who stands right there at M observes the two lightning strikes happen in the same visual perception of field, then we would say that relative to him, they were simultaneous. But only if we make one additional assumption, okay? This additional assumption is that the speed of light is always fixed and constant. So that means that the speed of light that goes from A to M is the same exact velocity as the speed of light which travels from the path B to M, okay? Why is it important that we make this stipulation that the speed of light is always constant and it never varies? Okay, well, let us think for a moment about how vision itself works, right? I assume right now you're looking at the screen where I'm lecturing and you can see my face in the screen and you know this whiteboard and whatever. But if you close your eyes right now, can you see the screen? And obviously we know the answer is no. So why is it that with the eyes closed, you see nothing but black? What's, what's the reason for that? It's perhaps something we don't always think about, but it's pretty obviously clear. Why is a closed set of eyes unable to perceive objects in your environment? Because what are you doing when you close the eyes? Question for you, just want the answer and then I'll move on. Why are closed eyes unable to see things in front of you? You're blocking the light, that is correct. Well, you're repeating me, Nicole. I know I'm asking the question to analyze why it is that when your eyes are closed, you cannot see. Do you understand that it's because the light has been blocked from the eyes being able to receive them? The skin of the eyelids act as shades which block incoming light arriving to the retina. Okay, but if you, I mean, if I ask you why do, do you not see things with the eyes closed, you just say because you're closing your eyes. I'm asking for an, an analysis of the reason why closed eyes produce that phenomenon. Okay, so yes, yeah, so light can't get in there. And when you see things, why are you seeing them? Because light that is reflected off of the object from whatever distance travels off the surface of that object to your eye. Okay, so now this guy sees A and B because the light emitted from A and B travels towards where he is standing and hits his eyes standing at M. Now look, we have to assume that the light moves at the same velocity from A to M as from B to M in order for this test to verify simultaneity. 
Because if light does move at the same speed, then given the fact that the two light signals have arrived at this destination, M, at the same moment, and given the fact that they've traveled the same velocity over an equivalent distance, we could deduce that they were emitted from their two origin points at the same time. And that's what simultaneous would mean. So two light signals get to his eyes from these two sources. If they're traveling the same distance, and that's why he's at the midpoint, so they are traveling the same distance. If they're traveling the same distance, they arrive at the final destination, M, at the same moment, and they've covered the distance with an equal velocity, then that means that they have to have left the two origin points at the same time. If we did not assume that light moved at a constant speed, then this would not be able to verify simultaneity. Let me give you an analogy if I could, okay? Suppose that A and B are two runners running a race, okay? And this is the starting line, A and B, those points. And suppose that M here is the finish line of the race, so it's a set distance. It's an equal distance that the two runners have to run to compete in the race. Suppose that A is twice as fast of a runner as B, but that, that A and B both arrive at the finish line at the same time. So think about my question, okay? A and B, let's pretend, are runners that have to run an equal distance to get to a finish line in a race. A is twice as fast as B, but A and B meet at the finish line at the same time. Under those conditions, which of the two runners had departed first? If A is twice as fast as B, but he still reaches the finish line at the same exact time as B, under those conditions, which one departed first, B or A? B, the slow runner, A, the twice as fast runner. Arrive at the finish line at the same time, so B would have left earlier. You understand? He has been given a head start by A, who's twice as fast. So he runs half the way through the race. A waits like the tortoise and the hare until he's at the halfway point. And then because he's twice as fast, he leaves later and still gets to the finish line at the same time. So even if the two runners arrive at the finish line at the same time, if one is twice as fast, we can conclude that they did not depart at the same time. And therefore, for this test of simultaneity to work, we must stipulate that the speed of light is the same from A to M as from B to M. Given that the speed of light remains the same from both directions to M, and given that they arrive at the finish line at the same time, like those two runners of equal speed, we could deduce that they both departed at the same time. And that's what he says here. Einstein says this. After thinking the matter over for some time, you then offer the following suggestion with which to test simultaneity. By measuring along the rails, the connecting line AB should be measured up and an observer placed at the midpoint M of the distance AB. This observer should be supplied with an arrangement which allows him visually to observe both places A and B at the same time. If the observer perceives the two flashes of lightning at the same time from this position, then they are simultaneous relative to him. And he says this, I am pleased with the suggestion, but I cannot regard it as quite settled because I must raise the following issue. The definition would certainly be right if only I knew that the light by means of which the observer at M perceives the lightning flashes travels along the length A to M with the same velocity as along the length B to M. And then further down, he just says, um, this is a stipulation which I can make of my own free will that light requires the same time to travel the path A to M as for the path B to M. So there we have now given our working operational definition of simultaneity relative to these two lightning strikes. What does it mean to say that they were simultaneous? It simply means that an observer who is placed in between the two events at the midpoint would see the two events happen at once from that midpoint observer position if we additionally assume that the speed of light is always fixed, okay? And so using that as the definition of simultaneity relative to one observer, that the light signals emitted from the two distant events arrive at the person's visual system at the same time, we therefore define simultaneity in that way. And using that idea of simultaneous, that an observer 
receiving light signals from two events would claim of them that they're simultaneous, we can use that idea to define what it is for us to coordinate our behavior in space by means of the clock. So take like a typical wristwatch, like what I'm wearing here. If it has pointer hands, for example, the pointer hands are a reliable measuring instrument that move at a specific rate. And if we all set our watches to a synchronized position, then for example, when I say to you to arrive to the lecture at 2.30, uh, remember back when we went to the actual physical classroom, you could say that that is to be analyzed in this way. Make the, make the observation of two events happen at once. Witnessing the pointer hand of the clock indicate 2.30, and have that visual perception be seen simultaneously with you taking your seat in the classroom. We can therefore coordinate behavior in space between different observers by having all of us use similar uh, measuring instruments like clock faces and then tell people that when the pointer hands or digital face of the clock indicates a certain time measurement, you should be in a position where you can also visually observe the event which is supposed to be happening in synchronicity with the indication of the time device. So there's a definition of simultaneity, but it gets much weirder just now. Because what I'm going to show you in the next moment is that the same two events, the same two lightning strikes A and B, which are perceived as simultaneous relative to this motionless observer at M, will not be seen as simultaneous relative to a second observer who possesses a certain state of velocity. All right, so let me add another observer to the scene here, okay? Just to declutter it a little bit, like we could have left the arrows up there, but I just kind of wanted to create a little bit of additional info so it's less cluttered. Now take a train. Now let's say this train is traveling from left to right with constant velocity V. And on this train, there's an observer in the moving train, okay? Now, this observer that's in the moving train is traveling from the direction of A toward the direction of B, from left to right on this diagram. Um, so let us suppose then that according to his frame of reference, all events are observed relative to his state of motion in the moving train. So observation of events always happens with reference to a given reference frame. This guy standing still is one reference frame, and he observes all events from his motionless standpoint. The other observer moving with the moving train observes all events in reference to that body of, uh, of movement, the train and its velocity. So just as there's a midpoint as seen from the observer's position here, there's a midpoint which the train will pass through as it travels from left to right. Now let's designate that midpoint here and call it M prime, okay, M prime. That's the midpoint as it is seen from the traveling observer's perspective on the moving train. Okay, now, suppose that as this guy goes along the path, he intersects with the midpoint here. He basically touches M prime at the exact moment that this guy down here is conducting his own observation of A and B. And from his vantage point, A and B were seen as simultaneous events because the light sources took an equal time to reach him from their equally distant positions traveling at the same velocity. But ask yourself this new question. Suppose this observer who's moving along the train with velocity V was to intersect with M prime at the same moment that our motionless observer looks at A and B. Now, if I could like say this was a playthrough video of the guy on the train, imagine that I hit pause in the video playthrough at the exact moment that he's here at M prime. At that moment, he is perfectly aligned along this midpoint axis with the other observer. That's how it would look for a split second in time as he intersects with the midpoint. But if I hit the unpause button or play, whatever, will he remain at M prime, the guy who's on the train? Will he stay at the midpoint like the other dude who's standing still? Tell me the answer to that question. In 
a case of viewing this as on a video where we momentarily pause the playthrough while he stands at the midpoint traveling with velocity V. Will he stay at midpoint M prime? No. Which direction will he be carried towards? In the direction of what? You're right, the answer is no, he will not remain at rest. He will continue on in his path towards which bolt? He will continue towards B. That's correct, Abraham, and all of you others listening. So notice this. Will he then observe the two lightning strikes to happen simultaneously, as this guy did? This guy saw the two events happening simultaneously. He's passing through the midpoint, and he passes through it. He traverses the midpoint at the moment that this other man does his observation and sees them simultaneous. Will he see them simultaneous? the second observer who conducts his observation as he passes through men prime and while he's observing down there. What's the event that the second observer will see happen first? Let's see if you can compute this one. The second observer won't see them happening simultaneously. Which one of the two will he perceive as happening first before the other one? The second observer, the one on the train. Which one does he see happening first? He sees B first. That's correct, Sorush. Tell me why. Why is it that from his frame of reference and given his state of velocity, he does see B first and then after that he sees A? Why is that? You're able to say just based on the information I've given you, but let's see if you can put that together. Why does he appear to see B happening first? The other guy sees them happening simultaneously. So why is it that the second individual does not? Why does he see B happening first? You gave the right answer. It is B that he sees first. So why did you have that intuition? Because, yes, he's closer to B. Since he's traveling with velocity towards B and away from A, the light signals that are coming from A and B will not be able to reach him at the same moment because there's an asymmetrical distance between himself and the two light signals now. He's opening up a greater gap between himself and A beyond the midpoint, and he is shortening the interval of space between himself and B as he closes in on B. So he and his visual system is a moving target for these two light sources to reach. A has to catch up because it's running from behind as he goes away from it. B, he's rapidly closing in on. And so there's just less distance between his eyes and B and his eyes and the growing space between himself and A. So when an object is more distant from A than B, and they both have the same speed of light traveling towards his eyes, those two light signals cannot possibly reach his eyes at the exact same moment. One is closer, the other is farther. So how weird is that? Because now we see a different answer to our question, were A and B simultaneous? They were simultaneous with respect to the viewpoint of this motionless observer positioned at M, but they are non-simultaneous regarding this observer who's traveling with velocity V in the direction of B and away from A. So the same two events, the same two lightning strikes are simultaneous to one observer and non-simultaneous to another, namely because B happens first and then A. Okay, let me read to you then Einstein's description of this, and therefore it will become very clear. He says this, um, <clears throat> Up to now, our considerations have been referred to a particular body of reference which we have called the railway embankment. We suppose a very long train traveling along the rails with constant velocity V, and this is indicated in figure one on page 456, but anyway, with velocity v. People traveling in the train <clears throat> will regard the train as a reference body and regard all events in reference to the train. So every event which takes place along the train track um, also takes place at a particular point of the train. So our two events, the two strokes of lightning A and B, which are simultaneous with reference to the embankment observer, also simultaneous relative to the train observer, we shall show that the answer is no. When we say that the lightning strikes A and B are simultaneous, 
we, with respect to this observer, we mean the following. The rays of light emitted at the points A and B, where the lightning occurs, meet each other at the midpoint M of the length A to B of the embankment. But the events A and B also correspond to positions A and B as seen from the train. Now, let M prime be the midpoint of the distance A to B on the traveling train. Just when the flashes of lightning occur, this point M prime coincides with M. But it moves towards the right in the diagram with the velocity V of the train. If an observer sitting in position M prime in the train did not possess velocity, if he was just standing still like he is, then he would remain permanently at M, and the light rays emitted by the flashes A and B would reach him simultaneously. But in reality, since he is hastening towards the beam of light coming from B, while he is riding ahead of the beam of light coming from A, the observer will therefore see the beam of light emitted from B earlier than he would see that emitted from A. Hence, the observer will see that emitted before. Observers who take the railway train as their reference body must therefore come to the conclusion that B took place earlier than A. And we thus arrive at the important and very surprising result. Events which are simultaneous with reference to the embankment are not simultaneous with respect to the train and vice versa. And that is the relativity of simultaneity. Every reference body has its own particular time. Unless we are told the reference body to which the statement of time refers, there is no meaning in the statement of the time of an event. Before the advent of the theory of relativity, it had always been assumed in physics that the statement of time had an absolute meaning and that it was independent of the state of motion of the body of reference. But we have just seen that this is, is incompatible with the definition of simultaneity. Okay, so there is the very deep and weird result that we can no longer say objectively that A and B are simultaneous. Let me ask a trick question to you here listening. Simple, deceptively simple question. Are the two lightning strikes simultaneous or not? Are they simultaneous or not? And I'm gonna give you a hint, this is kind of a trick question, which doesn't necessarily have a straight answer, but maybe you'll be able to tell me what the answer is. Are the two lightning strikes simultaneous, yes or no? What's the answer to that question? Hmm, what could it be? Let's see who can tell me. Are they simultaneous? At the end of this whole demonstration, it does depend on the observer, correct. The right answer is that it is relative. Relative to the motionless observer poised in the position M, they're simultaneous because the light signals reach him at the same time. But relatively to this observer who's in a state of velocity carried towards B and away from A, the same two events are non-simultaneous because it is B that occurs first and A later. Now, you may be misunderstanding, and I don't want you to misunderstand this one point, but it's okay if you do because a lot of students initially will stumble on this. You may be thinking in your mind, but isn't there an objective fact that they actually are simultaneous and this guy therefore is seeing it as it actually is, but because this guy is moving around with velocity, he's seeing a distortion of reality. So in fact, it's objectively simultaneous, but other observers will just see some illusion based on their state of motion. And that's not the way to think about it. It's deeply relative. There's no correct observer here. It's not like he's the one that sees it as it is and it is simultaneous and he's seeing something that's off because he's moving around. No. There's no privileged observer here. There's no standpoint from which to say, I'm conducting the correct observations as it were, while other observers, depending on their state of motion, are differing from me because of that. We're all in motion relative to others because there's no fixed point to observe anything from in the universe. Even if you're sitting still right now thinking you're sitting still, you're on the surface of the earth and therefore you're being carried with a velocity, massive velocity of the whole planet as it orbits the sun and rotates on its axis. So there's nothing ever that's truly like in a stationary position, only relative to other observers that are in other parts of space. So therefore, you cannot say any more that he is the correct observer than that he is. And so the set of facts that we have is, I don't know, in my mind, it's just weird and almost disturbing. Like A and B, there's no objective order to them. How weird is that? You would have thought that in the time sequence of space and time, events have an objective linear sequence and that they cannot be reordered in a different order. But what this is telling you is that that's not true. Events that you regard now as happening later in the future 
could be seen as already having happened in the past, given a different possible observer's state of motion and uh, spatial position, okay? And it gets even weirder and mind-bending because it starts to make you think, as an implication of this theory, that all the events of space-time are equally real because those that you regard as not having happened yet, since they, according to you, lie in the future, could be seen as having already had happened in a different vector of space-time by a different possible observer. Thus, the reality of all the moments has to be granted equal. Past, present, and future, then, are all equally real. So it's not like what many people say as cliches. The present is the only thing that counts. The future is not here. The past is gone. On this space-time theory of Einstein's, a consequence of the relativity of simultaneity is that all the moments of space-time, inclusive of the full past and full present and future, are equally real. Um, to make it even stranger, let me add a third observer to the situation here. Suppose we had an observer traveling in the opposite direction, this guy, and he's on a different train that's moving from right to left with velocity v. Suppose that he passes through the midpoint m double prime, and while he does, he's alignment with this observer going the opposite way and this motionless observer standing at m. So for that one split second, if you could pause, they'd all be perfectly aligned on that parallel plane. But since he's going in the opposite direction of travel from this man, he will see yet a different result. And what would this result be? The third observer would see which event occur first for the same reason, just in the opposite direction. The top observer up there that I just added to the board sees which one happening first according to his direction of travel and velocity. He sees A occur first, right, because the same reason. He's closing distance between it, so the light signal has smaller distance to travel to reach his eyes than the longer distance traveled by B, which he's running from. So it gets just more bizarre. A and B are two lightning strikes. So what's the answer? Do they happen at the same time? Does B happen first, or does A happen first? And all three answers are possible to give according to a different possible position of observation and a different state of velocity. How strange is that? It makes it occur to you that there's no objective ordering to the linear time sequence which you, which you ordinarily think exists. So it's so trippy and mind-bending, right? Like your future, according to this, is predestined. All the events that you think have not got any definite nature are already uh, located along the objective timeline of space-time. And so you're kind of therefore just an observer of the events, not even capable of doing otherwise than what's already foretold within the space-time framework. Now, um, that's the Relativity of Simultaneity paper. I wanted to add a couple of more uh, insights to this that are also derived from the work of Einstein that just deepens the mysterious nature of the whole thing we're talking about here. So the next point to understand about relativity theory, this is a brief crash course on it, but I'm trying to give you the most interesting philosophically rich parts of it. The next thing I want you to understand is something called time dilation which is a real phenomenon that does occur and was discovered by this theory. So <clears throat> to explain this concept, I'm going to employ the idea of what's called a light clock, okay? Here's how a light clock works. You have two panes of mirrored glass. So that provides a reflective surface for, for light to bounce off of, okay? Take a photon of light and let's excite this photon so that it travels towards the top plane. And then because it's a photon and this is a reflective surface, it's gonna bounce it back down to the other uh, side of the light clock. And then that, of course, will bounce it back up. So the photon, we have a bouncing photon going up and down in between the two layers of glass. Now, this then can be turned into a time measurement device. For each cycle where the photon beam touches top and bottom, let us say a second passes by, uh, as according to your wristwatch, one, two, three, four. So it just goes on in that way, right? It's, it's perfectly reliable because the consistency of the speed of light ensures that it doesn't change its speed as it goes up and down. Okay, now I'm gonna add another light clock. We're gonna have two of them. So here's the top one and here's the bottom one. Let's say that they are like twin light clocks. They're of identical construction and they're in perfect synchronicity with each other. So as, they, as the one moves, so does the other, and they're keeping time in unison. One, two, 
three. So we've made a time measurement instrument, basically a clock out of this light system. Okay, now imagine that we've got an observer here. There's the observer down there. The observer observes these two light clocks with the bouncing photon beam. Now, assume that we leave this light clock, the bottom one, in a state of rest, so it's not moving. The one on the top, let's imagine we accelerate very, very quickly to the right at a constant velocity v. And let's imagine this is a very high rate of travel, like close to the speed of light even. Okay, now, considering that we have got these two light clocks, the motionless one for a moment, the angle of approach of this photon from the top to the bottom surface is going to appear to this guy to simply be a straight vertical line, an exact, you know, straight line, because it's just going up and down, and it's standing still. But what about the one up here on the top? This guy's standing still. When this starts accelerating to the right, what do you think will happen to the angle of approach of the photon between those two planes from this motionless observer's vantage point? What do you think would be the angle that that would take? It would bend. It would now become somewhat of a stretched out diagonal. So it's going to look like this now. And why is that? Because as seen from the motionless observer's viewpoint, it's got velocity carrying it to the right. The faster it's going to the right, the more gradual the amplitude and trough of this photon's pattern of movement will appear to be. Okay? It's sort of like a phenomenon that's well understood in acoustics, which is called the Doppler effect. So let me explain the connection really briefly. If you're ever standing still, and let's say a car drives past you at a certain rate of speed and it's honking its horn, you notice modulation in the pitch of the horn sound as it approaches and as it drives off into the distance. So generally the way it works is that as it gets closer to you, the pitch of the horn raises and becomes higher. And as it gets farther from you, the pitch of that same horn starts to appear to have a lower tone. Why is that? Well, because as the moving car is closer to your body, the amplitude of the sound wave gets scrunched up because it's less distance between the object emitting the sound wave and your ear. So that creates a more spiky, scrunched up sound wave, which produces a higher pitched tone. And as that same moving object goes away from you, the distance that's opening between it and you creates a longer and more stretched out amplitude and trough of the same sound wave generating a lower tone. That's the reason that this experience or phenomena happens. It'll be like you're standing still and you hear the car as it passes. Now, if you're in the car and you're hitting the horn, you don't hear that modulation in frequency because you possess the same velocity that the car has. So there's not this difference between the distance of the object emitting the sound and your body. But when you're standing still relative to the car, you do hear that Doppler effect. Now, photons of light behave somewhat like particles and somewhat like waves. So the wave-like property of light accounts for this phenomenon here. As the fast-moving light clock is accelerated away from our motionless observer, he will see a more gradual angle of approach that the photon takes on its path from the top to the bottom plane of the glass. So, okay, if we took this light clock, accelerating it very quickly close to the speed of light, allow it to, let's say, orbit the Earth several times at that speed, and then reunite it with its twin and put them both back in a state of rest, which of the two clocks do you think, when they've been reunited, will have elapsed and counted more seconds. Which of the two clocks, the one that's been moving fast or the one that's been standing still, will have recorded more seconds than the other one? Well, it is the top one that records fewer seconds, Sarouche. So no, why is that? Let's see if you can tell me why you think that the correct answer is that this one records fewer seconds and this one records more. It has to do with the distance the photon has to travel to complete one cycle of top to bottom. Can we understand why the top one takes longer? 
for it to complete one top to bottom cycle? Why does it take longer for the top one that's moving relative to the other one that's standing still? Because, again, why? Let's see if you can tell me. Why does the bottom light clock take uh, count more seconds? Why does the top light clock count fewer seconds? And you're right, it's because the photon has a longer trajectory to travel to complete a cycle. Okay, whereas this has to go on a big diagonal and it's more stretched out the faster it's moving, this one simply has a straight vertical up and down. So while this is going like this, the other one's going like this. And that means that the top one is counting fewer seconds. So when there's been a reunion between the two light clocks, they are not the same age anymore. Which one is older? This one that has been counting more seconds. That's very strange and weird because here's what it means in practical terms, that these two light clocks, which may have been created on the same day and issued from the assembly line at the same moment, that were in perfect synchronicity with each other, they're now not even the same age. One has more seconds that have passed than the other one did, even though they started off at the same age. Um, and this gives rise to a paradox in this whole world of uh, contemporary physics, which is called the twins paradox. So I'm going to close this last few discussion of Einstein with this point about the twins paradox. Okay, now suppose that you have two identical twins. And as you guys know, identical twins are roughly the same age, born pretty much at the same time. So they go through their whole life the same age, right? Suppose, though, that you took one identical twin and you s accelerated them away from the planet Earth in a rocket really close to the speed of light, if that were possible, right? And then you return that person back to the surface of the Earth where their twin has been resting at, at rest and not moving as fast. When that fast-traveling twin comes back, what will he discover when he reunites with his identical twin counterpart? The fast-moving twin traveled close to the speed of light, comes back to the planet Earth. His counterpart wasn't going as fast. So when he returns, what's he going to notice about his brother or sister that's his twin? They are older. The twin that was Earth-bound, not traveling at that high speed, has become older than the one that was going fast through space. And that is, again, because of the same exact result. If one of the observers was traveling with the light clock, when you're moving with the light clock, you don't see this angle of approach that's a diagonal because you possess the same velocity as it. Just like if you're driving in the car, you don't hear the Doppler effect when you do the horn. Only motionless observers outside of it see or hear that effect. So how weird is that, though, to have identical twins that you would think cannot age at different rates, but when you've come back, less time has passed for the fast-moving twin than their stationary counterpart. That's the reason for, like, in the scenes in the end of Interstellar, uh, Matt McConaughey returns to Earth after he's been zooming around through the universe on these interstellar missions going very fast. And when he comes back, he's providing comfort to his daughter, who's on her deathbed, who's now leapfrogged beyond him in age. How weird would that be to have a child and then the child becomes older than you because you – travel through space close to the speed of light for a certain interval of time. You'd think it'd be impossible, but it just shows that time itself can stretch and dilate depending on the frame of reference that you're in and your velocity relative to other observers in space. So since these are true theories, uh, which have been proven through empirical investigation and not just pure philosophical speculation, why then do you think it is that if you are, let's say, a person that flies a lot or drives very fast or just runs all the time, why is it that we don't see you aging slower or your clock getting out of sync with people that don't travel as much or who, let's say, just stay uh, sheltered in place and don't go anywhere? Why then do these effects not seem to be measurable in everyday life? Why do you think? If the theory is true and a fast-moving observer passes through time slower than a uh, stationary observer, then how come people that are always taking flights and catching flights, we don't see them aging at a slower rate than everybody else? Why do you think that is true? Well, it's not about breaking the speed of light, which cannot happen because you can't even go uh, that fast. It's rather similar to your point, though. The reason is because we don't have the ability to achieve variable speeds uh, of that degree. 
So how much faster than you can I possibly go, even if I was going the fastest speed a human could travel? If I was in a mock speed like fighter jet, maybe I could go several times the speed of sound while you're standing at rest. But even that discrepancy in velocity is not enough to make the experience time dilation more than infinitesimal. Uh, so basically the reason that we don't see this happening in everyday life is because we can't achieve speeds that are so much divergent from others that the effect would be something that would add up. Um, but if there were the ability for a human body to withstand the physical forces, and if we had the ability to create a, me a mechanism of travel that sped you at that rate, then we would have huge problems keeping our time uh, synchronized. Some people's clocks would be moving slower than others. Some people would be aging at different rates than other people. But at any rate, bound by the earth, terrestrial earthbound creatures not able to go at that speed, these effects don't necessarily have a, an impact on us that can be measurable beyond the nanoscale. But they have been proven. Uh, what we can do is little particles, tiny little elementary particles, we can use particle accelerators like those that we have in Switzerland and accelerate them very close to the speed of light, like 90% plus to the speed of light. And when we do that with elementary particles, which can withstand those forces, uh, unlike a big body like me or you, they do in fact exhibit a half-life that becomes dilated to the exact proportion predicted by the formulas of the theory. So this is not just speculation, it's been proven in physical experiments. Therefore, it's just a weird idea to consider real. Um, if you could step inside a centrifuge and somehow survive being spun close to the speed of light, then depending on how long you were in it, when you emerged from it, you'd emerge into a world that had aged much more than you. So like five minutes on your watch in the centrifuge could be 10, 20, 15 years outside for everybody else because they don't possess the same velocity as you. So that's like kind of the theoretical possibility of future time travel right there. Okay. Well, that's what I wanted to add to the notes on Einstein. We had a lot more to cover on him. Next up, on the same topic, it's this author, and his name is Theodore Sider, sometimes just referred to as Ted Sider for short by uh, other philosophers in the field. So Ted Sider, <clears throat> he was born in 1967, and he's still alive, just an American philosopher, doing good work still. Um, in 2005, he wrote a book, and uh, our textbook extracted a little section from that book and just has retitled it Time. <clears throat> so Ted Sider, 2005, articles called Time. Okay, so this is the next piece that we're adding to our collection of materials here. Um, <clears throat> so what he's doing in this paper is basically he's trying to serve up the uh, – the basic philosophical issues and puzzles that arise when you start thinking a little more in depth about the concept of time. He starts off by just noting that time is something that is so fundamental to our everyday lives that we usually don't take a step back to question it or ask what it's all about. Um, it's something that we just take for granted, right? It's like the air that we breathe. You just breathe. You don't think much about the behavior of inhalation and exhalation. It's just an autonomic process of your central nervous system. But then if you actually stop and think about like, what is breathing? And man, is it something I'm always doing? It can sort of almost seem like a labored effort. Like, wow, we gotta keep drawing in these breaths. Another sort of analogy. If you were a fish living in the ocean, you'd be literally immersed in water. Probably you wouldn't have much of a reason, even if this fish was intelligent enough, uh, to ask, what is water though, that I am constantly submerged within? You just live with it and you just take it as a given. Um, Alan, quick question. You say, if other planets in space orbit at different speeds, would that be enough to dilate time enough to experience change? The dilation can only occur with relevance to two frames of reference. So if one planet is moving quickly and another planet is not, then it does provide for the theoretical possibility of time dilation experienced by observers in the one reference frame as opposed to observers in another. But the orbital speed of the planet itself is not going to be close to the speed of light per se. Um, and it's about variability of speed. So if two planets, let's say we're both orbiting like at 100,000 miles per hour or something, uh, then they would not necessarily be in a time dilation state relative to each other because they both possess the same velocity. Like when you're driving on the freeway and you're going 80 and another car in the lane next to you is going 80, relative to each other, you kind of almost look like you're at a state of rest because you're just both moving that fast. So we would have to have, according to your question, Alan, one planet moving much 
much faster or slower than the other at such a rate of variability um, that the time dilation effects could be measured that way. Yeah, but I mean, if there's just two planets both going very fast, then there's not enough of a divergence. It has to do with differential speeds, okay? But that's a good question. So anyway, back to Cider. He says, we should question this though, even though it's something that we usually do take for granted. Uh, we should question it because once we start to look beneath the surface at what time really is, trying to explain it, we start to realize that it's quite puzzling, paradoxical, and our common sense ideas about it break down a little bit. So here's one thing he says that's puzzling about it. He says, uh, questioning time is difficult or, you know, the concept of time is, is puzzling because people say that time moves. <clears throat> It's puzzling because, among other things, people say that time moves. And the first big thing that this author wants to try and call out is, what does that mean, though? When we say time moves, what are we really saying? Like, how is that to be properly understood or interpreted? Because um, think of all the common cliche phrases or sayings that we have which give expression to the thought that time moves. What's something that a person might say which calls to mind the idea of time being in a state of movement? Anybody have any like fine phrases they've heard before where you say time blank and then you say something with that blank word that indicates like a state of something moving? Any words or phrases that come to mind when I say that? I've got a few that I could rent to throw out there, but just see if any of you had something. When you say time is, time flies. Okay, good. Time flies, that's one thing someone might say. Someone might say time is passing. So flight is a state of motion. To pass a thing is to pass it in space. Uh, to say, sometimes people say um, time marches on. To march is a physical way of moving. Sometimes people say time flows, like as though it's a river flowing and we're just caught up in the stream and the current's moving, right? Time waits for no man. That's another good one there from my brother Danny. Anyone wants a shout out? My brother Danny, Coach Bullish. Yeah, so um, waits is a little ambiguous to be fair though, Danny, because weights could just have to do with the temporal uh, waiting. But I guess if you're saying like wait before you continue your movement or whatever, that's fine. Sometimes people say time stands still as though the typical case is it's moving, but then once in a while it randomly stops. Um, so anyway, what these different cliche phrases indicate is that when we think of time ordinarily, we think of it as some kind of moving structure and we're caught up in the currents of its movement. But now we have a real tough question how do we explain the concept of time moving? One reason he says that that's definitely difficult to express is because the concept of movement or motion itself uh, involves reference to the idea of time. Okay, so let me put that point here. <clears throat> okay, so... Explaining how time, quote unquote, moves is difficult because uh, the concept of movement itself depends on time. So what's being said here is that you need to make reference to, to time to even explain what the idea of anything moving is. So if time moves, it would appear that it needs to make reference to itself in its own explanation, which would be circular. Let me give you one little demonstration. So pretend this is a person here. My finger's walking around, okay? You don't really have to pretend that. It's my hand, all right? So look at my hand. Here it is at this point of the table surface. I'm gonna move it from point A to like point B, standing atop this surface of the book. Okay, let me demonstrate. Here's the hand, it's going over here. It's gonna move. There it is, it did it, it moved. Now, what just happened? For my hand to move from point A to point B, it had to be in different places at what? That's something for you to finish my statement. 
for my hand or for anything at all to move from one specific position to another, it has to cross, it has to be at different places at what? Moving, things moving around. That just means that they're in different places at what? Different times, correct. So for a thing to move at all, even just through space, like real ordinary movement, not the movement of time, but the movement of objects, for an object to move from one place to another, correct Nicole, Abraham, and others, it has to be in different places at different times. So if we're gonna try and say that time moves, by you know comparison, that would be like saying time moving means it's at different places at different times. But that doesn't make sense, because now we're utilizing the idea of time in an effort to explain the concept itself. That's going in a circle, that's like an infinite regress, and therefore it's not explanatory. To reinforce this lesson, the author provides a little diagram. What this diagram is going to show is it's going to basically chart the movement of a train starting in Boston and ultimately arriving in uh, what was the last destination. I'm going to write it here, get it correct. The ultimate destination is Washington, D.C. Okay, so we have four horizontal lines here. All right, and underneath each of the lines, I'm going to draw or I'm going to write the four place names that occur on the train's path, starting with Boston, then New York City, then Philadelphia, and then finally Washington, D.C. Okay, and here's another. And it's going to be the same underneath each of the four horizontal lines. Okay, now I'm going to draw to the left here. These are four time coordinates, T subscript 1, lowercase t, subscript 2, T3, and then T4. Now I'm going to show you the train's path. Starting off, the train departs from Boston. That's at the initial time, the departure. At a subsequent later time, it's now in New York on its journey. At a third time beyond that, it's in Philadelphia. And then fourth, even later, it arrives to its final destination in Washington, D.C. So this is just sort of demonstrating the concept of the train moving from point A to B. But look what we had to show. In order for this thing to move, we had to say it's at the different places, the different cities listed here, at these different separate times. Now, what if I had drawn the graph like this, that the train at time one was in Boston, at time two, Boston, time three, Boston, and time four, Boston. So just Boston, 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 Boston. If that was the graph being shown, would that be uh, showing the, the concept of the train moving? If it was at Boston at all four times, then did the train move? That's a yes or no for you. If the graph showed this way of looking at it. In this version of the graph, did the train move? No. In this version of the graph, the train just stayed at the station in Boston. It never went anywhere. In other words, it stayed at the same place the whole time. At all these different times, it didn't go to a different place. It stayed in one place at all the times. That's something that's at rest, something that is motionless. So in order to claim that anything moves, we have to assess that it is at different places at different times. But if time is now being claimed as something to, that moves, then by similar analysis, we would have to say that time moves by being at different places at different times. But how can time move with reference to time itself? How can we use the idea of time in order to provide an adequate explanation for the concept of its own movement? It seems like we're going in a circle, explaining that time moves by being in different places at different times. What are these different times that time is moving with reference to? Um, and if they are going to be organized in a linear sequence, then that would give rise to a third order sort of time within which those times move. And this would simply lead to an infinite regress, therefore explaining nothing. So here's another attempt to give an, an, an answer to our, our question. What does it mean that the time moves? The author says, perhaps this is what was intended. When one says that time moves, maybe what they indicate is that the present moment is moving. 
So maybe time moves by means of the present moment always shifting its position. Let's draw a new diagram to try and explore this possibility, although, spoiler alert, he's going to ultimately say that that's not going to ultimately work either. So the second attempt to explain the concept of time moving <coughs> by mentioning the movement of the present. Right, we've got these four horizontal lines in this graph. And these graphs, by the way, are shown on page 458 and 459 if you ever want to go into the book and double check those. But um, let's draw four different times of the day underneath each line. So starting with 12 noon, you know, lunch, and 3 p.m., 6 p.m., and 9 p.m. Just reproducing that in all four of the lines. <clears throat> Okay. Maybe this is the best way to explain the idea that time moves, say that present moment moves. So in a typical day, at one point during the day, it's 12 noon that's present. And then later on, you know, it doesn't stay 12 noon the whole time. It's 12 noon, that's present for a little while, but then later on at a later time in the day, 3 p.m. is present. But then even later in the day, three hours later, it's getting into the early evening, and now 6 p.m. is the present moment. And then finally, as we head into the later evening, still beyond dinner time, maybe some people winding down, it's 9 p.m., and then that becomes the present moment. So you might claim, okay, time moves because it's the present that keeps shifting its overall position. Um, <clears throat> make it, let's say, relatable to you right now. Right now on my clock, it's 3.33 p.m., April the 13th, 2020. That's present. This is live. This is not uh, the past, not yet. But this moment that's present right now, it will be the past in like an hour. When you look back on this later, or if you play this lecture back later, that's now something that happened already. Okay, but now it's it's current, it's present. That, that 4 p.m. hour later on is the future to you right now. But when it's happening in like an hour, and or sorry, 4 p.m. is like not even that long, 27 minutes. When that's happening in a little while of time, then that will be present. And then later in the day, 6 p.m. will be present. Earlier when you woke up this morning, say you woke up at 8 a.m. At that time, 8 a.m. was the present, but now we're just looking back on it because it's the past, it's not happening anymore. And what's happening right now, your lecture uh, was in the future when you woke up this morning, but now it's not in the future and soon it will be in the past. So you could argue that maybe time moves by means of the present moment shifting its overall position. Um, what's present right now, 334, it's going to recede into the past really quick, and uh, a future moment relative to the current time will become the present. But he says this still doesn't quite get us an answer that makes much sense. And the reason is because there's something wrong with this graph. Notice that to the left on the graph, along this axis, we have these four time coordinates, T1, T2, T3, and T4. What are those coordinates? They appear to be time designations. Like at the first time, noon was present. At a second later time, three was present. But how are these four items being placed in that sequence one through four? And what organizes them in that ordering? For them to have a linear ordering, it would appear that we would have to draw a bigger graph, which places them in the context of a third order sort of time. And again, this would just lead to further and further iterations of a higher order time sequence which, within which the lower order falls. And therefore, we never get to any non-circular explanation of time. Time's moving with reference to time, which is moving with reference to hypertime, which is moving with reference to double hypertime and on and on to infinity. So that just won't explain anything. And therefore, we return to the question, how do we discuss the movement of time? Well, he has a way of getting around this problem. And here's what he says we should do instead. He says, let's just completely give up on trying to make any sense of time moving. And instead, let us appeal to the Einstein space-time theory. Because according to Einstein's theory of space-time, time does not move. It just sits there integrated with space, containing holistically all of the events of past, present, and future. According to this block universe view, as some call it, there's no coming into being or passing out of being of anything in the universe. All events 
including past, present, and future, are equally real. They all exist. And so the past and the future are just as real as the present moment right now. That's a consequence of the relativity of simultaneity, which says that the sequence of events in a linear sequence have no objective ordering. Therefore, it's just a matter of relativity, whether a moment is in one's future or is present. Therefore, there is reality to all the moments given a possible condition of observation. As weird as that may seem, because it starts to tear at the whole idea that we have free will or that the future is open, as weird as that may be, as strange of a pill as that may be to swallow, it does help us eliminate the confusing perplexities associated with trying to define how it is that time moves. If we say time doesn't move, then that's not a problem that we have to uh, deal with. Instead of saying, here's how it moves and getting into some paradox, we just say, never mind, it's not moving at all. It's just like space. Space doesn't move. Space is something which contains all the events. And now time, according to the space-time theory, should be reconceived and thought of as having much more similarity to space itself. It's just a thing which jointly contains all of the moments and events, but it's not something which is in a state of becoming or going out of being. If that space-time theory is true, it's definitely something that runs counter to everyday common sense, because I know you sitting there think that your future is wide open and anything can happen in it. On the space-time theory, though, all events are already equally real. And so, in a way, it gives rise to the notion of uh, fate, uh, destiny. A certain timeline of events is set in stone, and therefore, according to this conception, you're not really capable of doing otherwise than what the events in space-time dictate. Um, so, I don't know, this whole coronavirus school shutdown, it seems like a big surprise, but I guess if the space-time theory is to be believed, then it was always something that was going to happen relative to our conditions of uh, observation. Um, it's not something that uh, was due to contingencies, but uh, rather that everything that does happen is necessarily so uh, because it's captured within the framework of all events in space-time that are all equally real. Um, now there's more to say about this because what I have to do next is expand a little bit on some of his discussion of space-time theory. He tries to provide a philosophical uh, analysis of it that makes it a little bit more easier for us to think of. Um, so there's maybe a 15 minute or so expansion on Ted Sire that we still have to run through. Um, so that's what I'm gonna say for the Wednesday meeting. I don't wanna compress too much into such a brief time here. Um, but I always do trip out on this lesson a lot because it makes me think a lot about uh, the nature of events in, in space time. If the space time theory is to be believed, then all events are equally real, even those that you think of as happening in the future. Um, does this mean that there's no real such thing as freedom of the will consistent with Einstein's theory of relativity? That's a very deep question. Uh, if anything, the theory kind of implies that the experience you have of the linear order of events, past, present, future, is somehow an illusion produced by our consciousness, but that that's somehow out of tune with the objective reality that we live within where there's actually no uh, flow of time and there's no movement from past to future, but rather just the co-location of all the events somewhere in the space-time framework. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, according to that, like when you think my future lying ahead of me, past is gone, that would then be the sort of illusion uh, to be explained away rather than affirming the reality of our common conception of time as a moving structure that flows from past and into the future. Um, so it's heavily revisionary of common sense. All those kind of cliche phrases and sayings like the present moment is the only thing that's real, seize the day, it's all about right now, the future hasn't happened yet. Uh, on the space-time theory, that's actually not correct at all. The present moment is not the only existing moment, all of them are even those future moments that you think don't have any reality yet. So there would be nothing special about the present according to the space-time theory. Uh, it's not an objectively present moment. It's only perceived as such by a particular point in the uh, observation condition of a, of a conscious being. Well, there's much more to say, uh, but I think I'll remain sort of uh, leave, leave a little bit left over for Wednesday on this Ted Sider material. So I really am uh, happy that you guys were here. I appreciate you guys 
feedback and input. Um, you know, we're dealing with a unique semester that we'll probably always remember. Uh, but I think that at least, you know, we've had some good consistency here. I see you guys arriving to the lectures and trying your best to keep up. Uh, you know, we should try our best to always attend these meetings. I know that a lot of people are just focused on more basic stuff now, like survival and everything. But let's uh, let's make sure that we do our school duty, try to show up to these lectures. If you can't watch them live, do watch them uh, as replays later. Um, keep reading through the textbook. Finish the Ted Sider article, and uh, next lecture we'll go over whatever's left over in his work. Okay, guys, so any other questions that you had for me? I mentioned at the beginning that I'll distribute uh, essay prompts over the weekend that we'll talk about next week on Monday and you have two weeks to complete the essays. Uh, study guide for the final, that's a few weeks beyond us yet because I want to give you two weeks or so, 10 days to two weeks to look at those before the test. But the test is during finals week, which is week 16 and this is week 12. So there's a ways to go before we do that. Um, well, anyway, guys, I appreciate you very much. Have a great day. Um, and if you ever need anything at all, do not hesitate to email me and, um, I'll talk to you soon and see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. <clears throat>